Our scripture reading today is going to come from Colossians chapter 2, but we're going to get there a slightly different way. We're going to turn first to the book of Psalms because Psalms begins with this unbelievable image that is going to lead and guide and introduce us to the theme from Colossians. So Psalm 1 reads, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Unlike a tree that is planted in a place that doesn't have a constant watering source but is dependent upon intermittent watering in the form of rains, Psalm 1 declares that the faithful person is like a tree that is planted near a constant source of nourishment, the streams of living water. And just as the faithful are fed the living waters of Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us that we will be fruitful and multiply, we will be fruitful and we will be prosperous when we are nourished by Christ. So In the season, we will bear much fruit, which will nourish and sustain those around us. And what's more, our roots will grow down deep such that when the winds of life begin to assault us, we won't be shaken or moved by them. The scriptures are clear. This is what the image means. If we are grounded in the word of God, we will grow strong. We will bless those around us and we will not be shaken by the winds of life. Conversely, and we didn't read this part of Psalm 1, Psalm 1 says that those who are not grounded in the same way, they're not grounded in the word of God, they are like chaff. Now chaff is an agricultural term. It's the byproduct of threshing, which is the separation of the seed from the dry and brittle and lightweight sheath that encases the seed. The process of threshing is actually somewhat of a violent process. It's done by grinding or beating or stripping the sheath from the seed. And then the farmer will take the seed and the chaff together and throw it in the air. The chaff will be easily blown away and the seed will fall harmlessly to the ground. In other words, Psalm 1 says that the person who's not grounded in the scriptures is like that chaff. When the winds of life prevail... They easily blow us where they want us to go. Not so with the tree that's planted by streams of water, right? Or perhaps we could think about it in this way. To continue the tree illustration, perhaps we could think about it this way. A tree that is not planted by a constant water source is likely to not have the nourishment that it needs and may rot from the inside and become hollow, From the outside, the tree may look strong, it may be tall, it may have a strong looking trunk, but when the winds of life pick up, it will splinter and come to the ground crashing with a thud. The scriptures declare that those who are grounded in the word of God are strong, but those who are not are vulnerable to whatever the prevailing winds of the time bring about. So I want you to keep that in your mind as we read Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15, because I think Paul may have had those in his mind as he wrote this, and it provides an illustration for us to think through the words that Paul has written. Let's read now Colossians chapter 2, 6 through 15. Paul writes, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised Jesus from the dead." 
When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's our reading for today from Colossians 2. The Apostle Paul, who penned this text, wrote this passage most likely while he was in the city of Ephesus where he spent three years of his ministry. He had one singular purpose behind the four chapters of Colossians. He was taking on what has come to be referred to as the Colossian heresy. The Colossian heresy. And he knew this community very well, and this community knew themselves very well. And so what's interesting about the Colossian heresy is he doesn't exactly explicitly tell us what the heresy's all about. He sort of just vaguely references it a couple of times, which has created a conflict for us because we're not exactly sure what the Colossian heresy was. But he didn't need to spell it out because he could communicate knowing that they knew themselves very well. I sort of imagine this being like, oh gosh, if one of my kids was sitting in worship and they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing, I could glance over at them from up here and they would know to stop exactly what they were doing and I wouldn't have to say a word. Maybe you've got that with your spouse. You can just give them a look from across the room and they know exactly what's on your mind and they know exactly how their behavior needs to change. Well, likewise, Paul knew this community well, and they knew themselves well, so he didn't have to spell it out. But frankly, this makes our challenge as modern readers a little bit greater, because we don't know exactly what he was referring to. Scholars have had a lot of fun with this over the years, trying to envision what it might have been from the few vague references that he uh, makes to it. They've come up with multiple different theories, and many scholars today think it's probably a synthesis of all of these different theories together. The first idea that they present is that maybe what was going on in the Colossian church was a form of asceticism. In other words, uh, some spiritual leaders maybe had infiltrated the community and said, hey, you should be more like us and treat your body harshly in order to cultivate the spiritual life. And if you were really spiritual, like we are with false pride, right? If you were really spiritual, then you'd be hard on your body in order to grow your spirit. Maybe that's what Paul's writing about. Another idea that scholars think maybe the Colossian heresy entailed was this idea of ceremonialism. In other words, there's a bunch of strict rules and regulations of what the Colossians could do or what they couldn't do, what they could eat and drink. And perhaps they think, well, maybe because of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, that these are related to the Jewish laws of the Old Testament. Like, if you were a Gentile person, somebody who was non-Jewish, did you need to become circumcised? You know, Paul goes on to talk a lot about circumcision in this past, in this passage. So perhaps it's because of the ceremonial law that was being upheld in the Colossian church. Another idea was that maybe what Paul was really addressing was this seedling of an idea called Gnosticism. Now, the best way to describe Gnosticism to you is sort of like, you know how to get into the gated communities that you live in? You either have to have special knowledge of a code or you have to have one of those little barcodes on your window. The idea behind Gnosticism was in order to get into the kingdom of God, you had to have this special knowledge and it would save you from this corrupt world that you were living in And in the second century, Christians explicitly forbade this kind of thinking because they said, actually, your salvation is completely in Christ and not on any special knowledge that you might have. So maybe it was Gnosticism. And still other scholars say, well, maybe it was just this human tradition. Maybe it had nothing to do with anything spiritual. It was just these rules that humanity had put on one another. Probably, in all reality, The Colossian heresy was a synthesis of all of these ideas, and to them, Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies, right? In other words, that word philosophy could refer to any or all of those things together. Well, despite the fact that we don't exactly know that which Paul was referring to through the Colossian heresy, I wonder if Perhaps God in his perfect wisdom and sovereignty chose to not 
reveal to us the Colossian heresy so that we wouldn't be focused on the content of that per se, but rather that we would be focused on the means by which we can address our own modern hollow philosophies. The truth is, our world today has its own synthesis of hollow philosophies. We might think of it as sort of like a canopy of a great tree, and under that great canopy of the tree that there are several different branches of ideas that are so intertwined that they become difficult to disentangle. And we might define that great canopy of the family tree as secularism. Now, secularism is basically the idea that the world doesn't need God, that in order to live well in the world and in order to relate well to others, we, we don't actually need God. We can do that all on our own. And there's a subset of this canopy of secularism, these different branches, and I actually, I owe most of my thinking about this to a book by Tim Keller called Making Sense of God. In a rather extensive footnote, he defines that there are different branches of secularism, and he calls them actually denominations, and here's what they are. The first is an idea that he calls scientism. Now, scientism is not to be confused necessarily with science. Science is a good thing, right? It's merely a process to study the natural world by isolating variables, forming a hypothesis, and then testing and experimenting in order to determine if your hypothesis is correct. It's a wonderful thing that has brought about so many good things for our world. Scientism, by way of contrast, isn't that, but rather a belief system that says that something is only true objectively if it can be proved by means of science. In other words, you can't say that anything of the subjective world is verifiable or said to be actually true unless it can be proved by science. Now here's the problem, and here's why I think it's a little bit hollow. That means that morality, which can't be verified by science, is a subjective thing. In other words, there's no such thing as real morality, it's just what human beings come up with. And religion can't be said to be true because religion is not verifiable, therefore, by science. So scientism is this belief, sometimes called also exclusive rationality, that unless you can prove something by the empirical scientific method, it is not true. And this is the first denomination of secularism. But Keller goes on to say there's actually a second denomination of secularism as well, one that he calls secular humanism. The idea of Secular humanism is basically this, that humanity, by means of our own reason, can make a more just and verdant world just because, you know, morality should be self-evident to any thinking person. In other words, we can be good without God. There's actually a book on secular humanism that goes by that exact title. Here's the problem. Secular humanism started with this philosophy of being good without God, but today where it's at is not only can you be good without God, but frankly, you're better off without God because religion is the oppressor of the whole world. In fact, wars have been started in the name of religion. Now, frankly, that's a little bit scary, and I think it's a gross oversimplification of the complexity of human history, but nonetheless, that's called secular humanism. And then there's this third denomination, of secularism. The third denomination of secularism is called postmodernism. In this branch of secularism, if, um, if scientism says that there's nothing that's true, if it can't be verified empirically, and um, secular humanism says we don't need God, but we can just define morality by means of our own reasons, postmodernism takes it even one step further and says, actually, why worry about truth at all? because there is no such thing as truth. What's true for you isn't true for me, and what's true for me isn't true for you. All truth is relative, and so we're left to make up these ideas as we go along. These three different branches of, of secularism lead to some really confusing ideas for a lot of people today. In essence, what the three branches of secularism come together to say is that all authority for making determinations about the world is on the shoulders of humanity. And we can make or create life and 
morality as we so fit? And why worry about what's moral and what's not moral? Those are just social constructs that we get to define for ourselves. Now for Christians, we look at this and we think, that's terrifying because we know the truth of our own hearts. And we've been taught by being Christians to be suspicious of our own selves and our behaviors and our actions because we know that humanity has a bent moral compass. If left to our own devices, we're going to get it wrong 100% of the time. It's not that humanity is a terrible thing. It's just that we make a lot of mistakes. I mean, that's the truth of my life. Is that the truth of your life? So secularism is a hollow philosophy of our world today And to this, Paul writes, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies that are dependent on human tradition. And yet that's what secularism is all about. Now Paul wasn't writing about secularism per se. He was probably writing about a synthesis of other things. But the the means by which he goes about making his contrast is by upholding who Jesus is. He says, unlike the hollow philosophies of asceticism or ceremonialism or or, um, Gnosticism or even just human traditions, rather than those hollow philosophies, he says Christ is the fullness of God. He says in verses 8 and 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in human form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. In other words, unlike the hollow and deceptive philosophies, the fullness of the living God dwells in Jesus. So therefore, Jesus is not one way to get to God as though there are many different paths to get there, but rather the very fullness of God incarnate is Jesus Christ. And therefore, who he is, is the the primary and only means to uncovering what it's like to have a relationship with God. And then Paul goes on to take it one step further. Not only is Christ the fullness of God, but it's only in him that you are brought to fullness of life. That when you have faith in Jesus Christ, the hollowness of your heart is filled up with his grace and his mercy and his love. He gives you a purpose and a meaning in your life has a significance that you never knew it could have and a joy that overflows the surfaces of your life. This is what Colossians chapter 2 is all about against the hollow philosophies of the world there is the fullness of Christ the truth is there have been many thinkers throughout the world who have wandered down the road of hollow philosophy only to realize that there's no significance to it at all I want to spend the rest of our time together today unpacking the lives of two great thinkers from the 20th and the 19th centuries. The first was one of the most prolific writers of the 19th century. He was born in 1828 into an aristocratic family on their family's estate in Polyana, about 130 miles south of Moscow in Russia. And though he was born somewhat with a silver spoon in his mouth, he didn't have life necessarily that easy. Because at a young age, his mother passed away. He was just two years old and his mother passed away. Nine years after his mom passed away, his dad also passed away. He was about to go live with his grandmother, who then passed away two months after his father had passed away. And he ended up, the only maternal person and caregiver that he really had in his life was his aunt. And she sent him away to school. And there his primary influences became the educational institution and his peers. And and Leo Tolstoy wrote a book called A Confession in which he tells the story of his own journey from pretty much atheism to coming to trust Christ as his savior. During this early phase of his life, he was not even 11 years old yet, he tells the story about how it is that he lost his faith. In it, he writes, I remember that before I was 11, a grammar school pupil visited us one Sunday and announced as the latest novelty a discovery made at his school. 
the discovery was that there is no God and that all we are taught about him is mere invention. I remember how interested my elder brothers were in this information. They called me to their council and we all, I remember, became very animated and accepted it as something very interesting and quite possible. So young Tolstoy is presented with this idea that everything he had been taught about God probably wasn't true. And he describes what happened to him from there almost as though his religious convictions began to thaw. He said, it's just like what happens to everybody. Their religious convictions begin to thaw and they thaw and melt and melt away until what used to be religious doctrine is just this shadow that used to be there. And he said, if you would push on it with a finger, the wall of religion would fall under its own weight. And this is what happened to him at a very young age. Still, Tolstoy wanted to maintain, he wanted to be good without God. He wanted to maintain the morals that he had been taught as a kid. And so he sought to be a pretty good person. Yet he got in with the art community. And to be frank, some of the art community that he was gathered around with just praised him when he was immoral. And so his life became consumed with the pursuit of ambition, of pleasure. He uh, cared more about what other people thought and was seeking the approval of everybody else. And, And his life wandered really, really, really far from the Lord. And yet it was during this time period that he experienced much of his success. In fact, he wrote War and Peace one of his most famous novels, during the time that he was far from the Lord. He was being praised and lauded by everybody in Russia for his wonderful work, and yet he was deeply unsatisfied with his life. So he moved to St. Petersburg, and there he joined the art community, and he kept meeting with other writers, and he was asking them the question over and over, what does this all mean? Why are we doing this? What is this all for? And he kept getting the response from them. Well, we are, we are the teachers of the world. We're creating culture. We have this really important job. And so he'd ask them, well, what are we supposed to be teaching? And he said, none of them could agree on what we were actually supposed to be teaching anyway. He said, what's worse, I looked at their lives and I saw that they were living a despicable life. He said, and then I looked at my own life and I was leading a despicable life. So he became consumed with these questions about meaning and purpose and significance, not finding satisfaction anywhere else. So he poured himself into his studies. He studied science and philosophy. In fact, a significant part of a confession is Tolstoy uh, taking all of philosophy that he had studied from Plato all the way through the Old Testament, through uh, the modern philosophy that surrounded Russia during the 1800s, and he said it was all meaningless. It meant nothing to him. And then his brother, the one who initially came to him and presented this idea that perhaps God didn't exist, died. And that question of meaning and purpose became even more significant. He asked the question, what meaning is there in life that death can't destroy? And he became so unhappy that he thought about ending his own life. And in one of his lowest points, a peaceful thought came over him. What meaning in life is there that death cannot destroy? Union with the eternal God. Still, even though an overwhelming sense of peace came over him and he began to thaw a little bit from his atheistic ways, he struggled for the next three years to come to terms with what it meant to have faith in God. Ultimately, he became a devout Christian. And as he looked back at all of his studies and all the things that he had sought to learn in order to bring meaning and significance to his life, he wrote this. Formally, life itself seemed to me full of meaning and faith presented itself as the arbitrary assertion of propositions to me quite unnecessary, unreasonable, and disconnected from life. That's where he was, right? Now, on the contrary, I knew firmly that my life otherwise has and can have no meaning. That only these propositions presented by faith give life a meaning. And in the great summary, he says, I had indeed come to faith because apart from faith, 
I had found nothing. Leo Tolstoy, one of the leading thinkers, brilliant novelist, explored all that the hollow philosophies of life had to offer, and he found in them nothing. And what filled the hole within his heart? What brought him joy? What thawed the hardness of his heart and led him from immorality to a life of goodness? It was faith, and not just any faith. It was faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord. I want to tell you this story about another guy. This gentleman, this gentleman was uh, about a generation later. He was one of the leading thinkers of the 20th century. And perhaps some of you went to see a movie in theaters just a little while ago called The Most Reluctant Convert. The Most Reluctant Convert was a story about the life of C.S. Lewis. Like Tolstoy, Lewis had a life of hardship as a kid. Really early in his life, right, right about the age that he was nine years old, Lewis's mother passed away. Lewis's father felt like he was so overwhelmed by the loss of his wife that he decided to send Lewis off to boarding school. And just like Tolstoy, his primary influences became not faith and not uh, his family, but it became the institution and became his peers. Now, candidly, it's my observation that God's primary means of expressing the gospel and enfleshing it in the world today is through the family system. And it's interesting to note that both Tolstoy and Lewis had a, a growing failure in their family systems because of their parents' passing. So Lewis went off to boarding school, and early on in his boarding school experience, just like Tolstoy, he wandered from his faith that he was raised in. He wrote these words to a friend of his, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, you can hear the intellectualism of Lewis already. From a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. So, so Lewis would spend most of his young life being a devout atheism. And in a book of his that he journeys his uh, walk to faith, he writes about how God was like a master chess player for him. With every move, God was pinning him in and seeking him out. So it was the fourth year of his studies at a prominent school called Oxford, which happened to be, at the time that he was there, one of the leading secular institutions of his day. And in Oxford, he met a gentleman by the name of Neville Coggill. And he had commented that Neville was, he was one of the most intelligent and well-read individuals on campus, that he, his only issue was that he was a devout Christian. And so Lewis became fast friends with Coggill, and the two of them developed a relationship, and Lewis was struck by the fact that Coggill not only professed a faith in Jesus Christ, but that he actually lived it, that he was chivalrous and kind and generous and loving, that he really was a great friend to Lewis. Still, Lewis was unwilling to let his atheism thaw and melt. By the way, if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, Narnia begins to thaw as the uh, great lion Aslan returns. And just like Tolstoy, Lewis's faith in atheism began to thaw as he met some Christians who really lived out what they believe. So Lewis developed a relationship with Coggill. And then he also noted that he was strikingly drawn not to the myths that he had consumed his life with. He was looking for meaning and purpose in all the ancient myths of the world, trying to figure out what the, what the myths had to teach him about how he should live. But he found that he wasn't drawn to them in the same way. So he writes about um, a great Christian author by the name of George MacDonald. And he said in one of his writings, George MacDonald did more to me than any other writer at the time except he had this bee in the bonnet of being a Christian. It was the only thing he could say negative about George MacDonald. And Lewis kept finding himself drawn more and more to other Christian writers. There was a, a, another person who was a literary figure from the same time period who had this dramatic conversion experience named G.K. Chesterton. And Lewis would say of G.K. Chesterton, he is, is the best modern writer of the time, save that he just happens to have this one fault of being a Christian. 
But more and more, Lewis found himself not only being drawn to Christian friends, but finding significance in the writings of Christians. And so in Surprised by Joy, his autobiography, he writes this. Those writers who did not suffer from religion, (laughs) those writers who did not suffer from religion, and with whom, in theory, my sympathy ought to have been complete, he names a few of them, all seemed a little thin, what as boys we called tinny. It wasn't that I didn't like them. They were all entertaining, but hardly more. There seemed to be no depth in them. They were too simple. The roughness and density of life didn't appear in their books. So Lewis already began to thaw just a little bit toward his atheism, and he realized that there was no substance in the philosophies of the world, that they all seemed hollow and tinny, And then there came a fateful night where another friend that he had met when he was teaching at a different university by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien went on a walk with him around the campus. And the two of them began talking about life and faith and all the different things. And Lewis, by this time, was consumed with the myths of the world. And J.R.R. Tolkien would say, yes, the myths of the world offer some shadow of the hope that we have. He said, if you're looking for the true story, you'll find it no other place than in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus who is the truth. The rest is just a shadow. And so Lewis, when he was younger, was concerned because the myths in Christianity had some similarities to them. But this conversation with J.R.R. Tolkien uh, convinced him that of course they have some truth in them because they're shadows of the real thing. And Jesus Christ is the real thing. And so very reluctantly, Lewis, in his room at the school where he was teaching, reflects on this. You must picture me, alone in that room at Magdalene, night after night, feeling, whatever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in, and I admitted that God was God, and I knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Two different stories of two different prominent thinkers who ended up writing materials that have withstood the test of time, two intellectuals who had explored all the philosophies that the world had to offer, and two men who came to the conviction that the philosophies of the world had no substance to them, that there is no reason to trust in them because in them there was no meaning that death couldn't destroy. And these two men came to faith in Jesus Christ and found a hope that endured not only in this life, but in the life to come. So there's a lot of hollow philosophies around us today, aren't there? A lot of ideas that we would love to receive as though they're going to be the hope and the savior of the world. Colossians 2 tells us there is but one hope and one savior of the world. The rest, of the, hollow, the rest of the philosophies are hollow, but the fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. And if you're looking for meaning and significance and purpose and joy, you will find it no place else. Jesus came that you would have life and have it to the full. I imagine that there are people here who have spent a significant part of your life wandering far from the Lord, chasing all the hollow philosophies I imagine there's at least a a dozen of you who found that those philosophies had nothing to offer you. I imagine that there's somebody here today who's still searching out all the hollow philosophies of the world. If the stories of Lewis and the story of Tolstoy are any, any indicator, you could spend an entire lifetime searching for the hope that you had to search no further than Jesus Christ. Let me close with reading once again from Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness.
You need look no further. If you'll root your life in him, you will grow up strong. You will bless those around you. And what's more, you'll be able to withstand all the hollow philosophies that blow your way and assault you. So let your life be rooted and established in him. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, we are so grateful to you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you, O oh Lord, that whereas the philosophies of the world don't provide satisfaction, you've not left us without hope. But that when we couldn't find our way to you, that you sent your son to us to provide us a new and living hope. Grant us the grace, O oh Lord, that we might root our lives in you and be built up and nourished and with thanksgiving offer ourselves fully to you. And we do this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.